Hey, everybody. Welcome again to Ham Radio Perspectives, where we look at the intersection of ham radio history, culture, and technology. My name's Quinn. I'm K8QS. Hey, and good day. I'm Tom, WA9TDD. And we do this on YouTube, but uh, we spread out all over the place. Wherever we can get these nasty videos going, that's what we do. And today we're looking at 10 meters, and we want to encourage you to get ready for 10 meters because 10 meters is starting to happen because of the sunspot cycle. We're going to look at how to get on 10 meters cheaply and effectively. And notice that little sunspot coming in there. They are going to be coming in. Big time. So hang on to your 10 meter hats, gang. Hey, Here's Quinn. an overview, yeah. Tom. Hey, what's so great about 10 meters? Uh, I tell you, when when is 10 really open? There's a good question. And what are the typical 10 meter conditions with and without sunspot activity? Well, we're going to cover that. We're also going to answer mm. the question, what are the best 10 meter modes? And following that, what are the best 10 meter antennas? And the best 10 meter rigs. And we got a couple of surprises for you. That's tr that's true. And what are what do you need to know about 10 meter operating? Yes, how to avoid making a fool of yourself mm. on 10 meters. So let's get mm. right into it, Tom. Mm. Let's start out with something that we don't often talk about with 10 meters, and that is brand loyalty and fellowship. Of all of the HF bands, Tom, I think 10 meters has the most loyalty and fellowship out mm. there. When people are hot on 10 meters. Once in their lives, they're always hot on 10 meters. And one example of this is the 10 Tech International Group. You can go to their website. They have membership. Uh, if you work 10 other people who are members and get their 1010 10 number, you're a member. You nets, chapters, they have contests, they have awards, they have a scholarship foundation. Go to 10 10 spelled out dot org and find out more about it. And that's on a national front, Tom. But even these local groups like uh, the Breeze Shooters out of Western Pennsylvania, uh, they're on 28.480 at uh, 9 p.m. Is it Monday nights, Tom? I can't that's remember. A, that's, that's on Monday nights, correct, Quinn? And, uh, you know, these uh, groups form a, a community and you can share information and uh, techniques, techniques. <laughs> Because 10 meters has uh, exhibited some really unique conditions. Yeah, so it's it's neat having all these local groups. And we'll talk more about that later, how important that is for these people that get together regularly. Because when the band starts opening in the evening, especially, you can find these groups. And Tom and I will talk about that group we used to be part of as well. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of brand loyalty and fellowship. That's one of the things that marks 10 meters. But really, what's so great about 10 anyway? I'll tell you, ask anyone who has operated 10 meters during a previous sunspot cycle, and you will find out quickly. 10 meters is a band of legend. It's, it's ham radio legend, kind of like six meters, but I think even more so because 10 meters is so tied to the sunspot. So when it's dead for a period of years, and then it starts to open up, and it really opens up, and it's open every day, and legends happen. For me, one of those legends, Tom was sitting in my little shack in Chicago where we grew up together. And I'm on 10 meter AM with 40 watts. And I worked this guy who's got a converted CB walkie talkie mm -hmm. on a bicycle going down the street. Mm -hmm. He was in, either in Arizona or New Mexico. I think it was New Mexico. Right. And uh, that was in Sunspot Cycle 20, and which was a really peaked out se uh, season. And um, and I had one of these uh, Night Kit C100s. It was my first uh, real introduction into radio. And although it was 11 meters with the uh, appropriate questionably legal antenna on it, um, heck, I could work my whole neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was an amazing thing, uh, the C100. And then there was a C, I think it was a 500 which is one that one of my buddies converted over to, to 10 meters. So the point is, it's a band of legend. You're going to work all kinds of interesting people in interesting places. And there are people that will hang out there every day on this band of legend. And they'll start telling you their stories. Now, some of these stories are like fish stories. You don't know whether or not to believe them. <laughs> but that's okay. So uh, when it's hot, Tom... It is hot. Right. And we were uh, young hams in the midst of uh, cycle 20 between 1958 and 1973. 
Um, and it was it was really really happened back then. But I imagine the folks prior to uh, and cycle nineteen had a had a heck of a time. Yeah, in the fifties, uh, the legend, uh, the lore of the fifties. Right, right. Uh, looks like we're coming up on cycle twenty five. It's uh, it's going to resemble a lot like the previous cycle twenty four, uh, with a peak right about the same. But in spite of that, it's going to be interesting. I I think so, and I don't know that I I want to stay with them a hundred percent on their predictions. You know, a twenty percent off on the prediction can make a huge difference on what it's really going to be like. But when it comes right down to it, the band is going to have hot days under the uh, sunspot cycle. There will be days, weeks, maybe a few months at a time that are way above the normal average for that time. And man, if you're on the band, then it is fun. And, it, and 10 is more consistent than six because the propagation is different. Right. And uh, you're uh, looking at the uh, high frequency VHF divide on 10 meters. Uh, 10 meters was originally divided, defined as VHF back in the Radio Act of 1927. And um, the, it's really the high end of the high frequency bands. It uses the F layer of the ionosphere for skip, uh, which is pretty typical. But... Um, yeah, we're not talking about sporadic E, which comes and goes kind of quickly on oh, six. We're talking oh. about F layer stuff, which we all think about with HF, let's say on other bands, on 20, on 40. Right, and six meter DX is uh, more influenced by uh, tropospheric ducting, which is a weather phenomenon rather than uh, reflection off of the E and F layers. And um, however... What about this trans-equatorial propagation? I know you're well-studied in this stuff, Tom, and you have various certificates or degrees or whatever in, in atmospherics, uh, seriously. So what about this? Well, that's similar to the F-layer propagation of the usual HF bands and uh, an associated skip, but the Earth's magnetic field influences the vector of signals to be in of a more north to south orientation and coming up we'll show you some uh, screenshots that illustrates that yeah so this is very interesting take a quick look look at this gang and you can see here the magnetic uh, field line the magnetic dip the equator and this north south you see south on the top left north on the right uh this is very interesting stuff let's take a look at uh this is six meter, 24 hour propagation. One of your images, Tom, tell us about this. Right, these are images taken off of uh, PSK Reporter showing uh, FT8 as the mode because of the fact that it's uh, pretty popular right now and there's a lot of signals I can capture shots of. And you'll notice that uh, within six meters, you're looking at about a 4,000 mile overall diameter, 2,000 mile radius of propagation both in the uh, North American continent and in Europe. So it, it's very clustered. It's not taking any um, advantage of either the uh, north-south trans-equatorial propagation or any propagation across the gray line. Here's 10 meter, 24 hour propagation. Again, using FT8 as the mode. And here you see some crossing the, uh, the gray line but it's still more of a north-south orientation. Right, and just to clarify for people, Tom, this gray line, what we're looking at here is the uh, dark versus light uh, with the sun. And so you see the light area there kind of over Europe in the center and Africa down below. And then the, the darkness on either side of that where the sun is has not come up yet or it's just gone down or whatever. Right, that's where the uh, sun has not uh, risen and uh, well, or fallen, and the um, ENF layer ionization is kind of in a situation where it does not attenuate signals in the HF band. But the point here is, you see a lot more north and south. Now here's 20 meters. Look at the comparison. Right, 20 meters. Here you have a lot of uh, propagation across the gray line. These uh, screenshots were taken about local solar noon time, so you can see the effect of uh, the sun and the solar activity affecting the E and F layer, and therefore the skip across the uh, gray line. So we get onto 20 meters when it's hopping during the day, especially in the morning, and you hear all these doggone Europeans. 
It's great. You might get into Africa a little bit, uh, some of the old Soviet bloc countries and the like. And then you, uh, you, you suddenly go up to 10 meters, as, as we just showed, and you get all this north-south stuff going on. It's very, very different. Right. Now, we think of band space, and the ARRL and some other uh, groups put out these little band space uh, spectrum so you can see what you can operate, which mode, where, and this is typically how they look. Now, the problem with this is it doesn't get at one of the big advantages of 10 meters, and that is that it has a lot of band space. So here is what these charts should really look like. Right. This is the relative band spectrum comparing 20 meters, 40 meters, and 10 meters. As you can see on the top, 10 meters has a whole 1,700 kilohertz of spectrum. There's a lot of room there for playing around different modes and experimentation. You get down to 20 and 40 meters, you're looking at no more than 350 kilohertz worth of band space. Right. So when 10 meters starts hopping, you know, some people think, well, they're going to go up there and they're going to get on at 28.3, let's say, where the sideband starts. And they say, hey, man, there are too many stations here. I'm going to a different band. <laughs> well, you go way up the band, up toward where the FM repeaters and the like are up around 29.5, 29.6 up there. And uh, I, uh, my recollection is even in the 60s during that one hot sunspot cycle we had, Tom, that I could always find open frequencies toward the top. Right. And uh, our, uh, on our nets back then on 28.9 at 9 o'clock at night, we were getting DX from uh, Canada and, and uh, Texas. Yeah, occasionally we, we would have a, a Japanese station come in. That That's kind of interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, another advantage of 10 meters is the short, easily made antenna. So a half wavelength. You can see the dipole there in black, a half wavelength fed with coax in the middle, insulators on either side. It's only about 17 feet, you know, adjustable for a specific frequency if you want, because it's a lot of band, but uh, only 17 feet. And this allows us to do a lot of things cheaply and effectively with with 10 meter antennas. And then down below in blue is an end fed. Again, it's a half wavelength. You can see on the right side, there's the little ballon and the coax coming out of the ballon. So you need a ballon here because you, you're dealing with two different impedances, the 50 ohm from the, from the coax. And you got to uh, match that to the antenna, feeding it on the end and uh, out to a tree. So 17 feet long, I have three or four of these. I'll show you a little bit more what I'm operating later. I say three or four because uh, I forget. I build them all the time, put them up, take them down. And normally I don't change them. I just keep them and, and hang them up. I've got all kinds of wire antennas hanging up downstairs. But typically I have at least one end fed up at a time. And for 10 meters, mm. HOA included, mm -hmm. these end feds are just uh, spectacular possibilities. Mm. So when is 10 meters really open? Point two here. Well, it's deceptive, gang. It's deceptive. Don't just go up to 10 meters after watching this video and, during the day sometime and say, hey, it's dead. These guys are all full of hot water. It might not be dead. Even with a band scope, uh, the signals can, especially the digital signals, can be so weak that they're below the threshold of what the band scope can detect. Right. And but we can uh, look for the beacons. People put these low power beacons out just a few watts between 28.1 and 28.3. If you go to the uh, 1010.org site, you can find a list of these beacons and frequencies and try tuning them in. So that's one way to see if the band is open, if the beacons are coming through. Mm -hmm. For me, Tom, here, I'm in Michigan right now. I know you're down in Florida right now, but in Michigan, uh, rarely can is it that I can't hear any beacons whatsoever. Typically, there will be at least one or two beacons from the general Texas area. They'll be weak, but I can tune them in. Right. And uh, the, don't forget the FM repeaters, although there's very few of them, uh, they can be tuned in and uh, listen on 29.6, which is the calling frequency, and see if there's any activity. Yeah, and if you got an FM rig, of course, you can you can find out what the tone is to key it up and go in there. Now, you're a big FT8 uh, guy, so tell us about that. Okay, well, FT8 is a weak, weak signal uh, mode, and uh, I track the activity, and it's almost in real time on PSK Reporter. There's also another function called Whisper, WSPR, which is a weak signal propagation reporter. Uh, you can look that up online, and you can get virtually real-time 
view of activity on not only 10 meters, but any of the HF bands. FT8 I like right now because of the fact that there's a lot of signals on there. It is a weak signal mode, which takes advantage of our current situations. I'd like to see as the sunspot cycle improves a little bit more in the uh, PSK variety where you can actually have a conversation. But for right now, FT8 works. Yeah, I tuned around for a PSK on my uh, IC7610, I, and I, I haven't heard any on 10. I do hear a little bit on some of the other bands, but obviously that's not, not a hot mode right now. We talked a little bit earlier about the evening nets. Mm. There are a lot of local nets on 10 meters, usually in the evenings, and they'll start up in the summers about 8 or 9 p.m. local time. And they are a ball. We mentioned the breeze shooters one out in western Pennsylvania you can listen for. But uh, Tom and I, growing up in Chicago, were part of this one in the Chicago on, um, what was it, uh, 28.9, I think. Right, Tom? Right, 28.9, the drip net. The drip and, net. And we had a round table that would last, uh, what, about an hour, hour and a half every night. Uh, this was basically on AM among uh, local hams within, what do you say, Quinn, about a 20-mile radius? Yeah, yeah, 20 to 30 miles in, we uh, started switching over to sideband, and we would have people bopping in from all over the country mm. because the band would suddenly start opening up, mm. and then we would have some DX stations coming in, and we knew once they were breaking in on our little local uh, QSO roundtable that uh, it was time to get out and hunt some others. So if you have a chance to listen in the evening sometime on 10, tune around for these local nets. Uh, I've worked a couple of them in the last couple months on 10. It just, just had a ball. What is this CB channel six, Tom? Okay, CB channel six, which is 27.025 megahertz, uh, also known as the Super Bowl of CB. Um, predominantly, a lot of these signals come out of Texas and Louisiana. These are high-powered CB operators. You can tune in. If channel six has happened, and you hear the uh, Roger beeps <laughs> and a lot of echo, that'll give you a good indication that 10 meters is open, whether or not there's anybody on 10 meters at that time. You know, throw out a CQ and see who comes back at you. Well, this is interesting, Tom, because I didn't know about this. I didn't come up to the hobby through CB and have never really studied CB that carefully, although I did write one academic article about it, but that's another story. The, uh, and so you told me about this a week or two ago and on my IC7300, I just tuned over to this frequency, uh, I, and uh, bam, the stations were coming in, and I couldn't see anything on the band scope on 10, but there were signals coming in on 27025, channel 6 on CB. And, of course, there are these free banders, so-called free banders. Now, now that, you know, that means different things to different people, but let's just say for our purposes here, we're talking about these operators, typically CB operators, who have old FT uh, 101s or whatever, and they're coming up in the air, the band spectrum between CB and 10 meters, so just below 28 megahertz. And if you hear them in there, of course, 10 meters is open as well. So don't be deceived about when 10 is actually open. Now, what are the typical 10 meter conditions? This is part of the lore, the folklore, and it's important to get a sense of this. If you're new to the hobby or if you're going to be new to 10 meters, listen up. Right. In the mornings uh, and the evenings, when the higher sunspots are going on, you're going to get some uh, it's going to be real DX. In the morning, uh, you're going to have DX of, to Europe and Western Asia, and that's from the East Coast of the United States. You're going to have fairly consistent propagation on the north south trajectory. Uh, during the midday, that's uh, any time around solar noon, I would say about an hour prior to, to four hours after your local solar noon. And let that me say is... something about that, Tom. Uh, back in the 80s, I was uh, updating my Spanish because I needed to go down to uh, Central America to a few different countries to do some research down there. And I thought, how am I going to do this? Uh, let's see, I need some regular people to chat with on in Spanish. So I started getting on 10 meters. This is in the 80s, mid 80s, I think. And in the, in the afternoon to late afternoon, and I would call CQ, hola, secu, secu, diez metros, you know, in Spanish. 
And I would always have people from Central or South America coming back. It was absolutely spectacular. And so I, that's how I practiced my Spanish, knowing there were going to be openings north-south. Right. Uh, and, and the late afternoon from the West Coast, you're going to have some pretty decent propagation into the Pacific and East Asia, particularly into Australia and uh, New Zealand. A little bit into Japan because that's more oriented east-west, but into uh, Hawaii, uh, Australia, New Zealand. Your best time is going to be late afternoon from the east-west coast, rather. And you got the localized skip, mostly seasonal, especially late spring, um, early summer. And I did operate in this past year quite a bit. It's kind of fun when this stuff pops up. And, of course, there's always ground wave. That's one of the reasons these 10-meter nets uh, are, are so popular and, uh, without using any repeaters. They just get on there using ground wave. If you got a decent antenna up a ways, you might get 50 miles or, or so. And then there's the green line that we talked about a little bit earlier. And uh, tell us about this one, Tom. Okay, again, this is a slide from comparing 10 meters versus 20 meters using FT8 off of PSK Reporter. Uh, this is showing, I believe we showed this once prior, but there's some 10 meter propagation across the gray line. This is local solar noontime. And about Brazil, a line from Brazil to um, Greenland. Yeah, but now. But, but yeah. you still see a lot of north south propagation there versus 20 meters, where it's just almost perfectly following the arc with a slight delay of the gray line between the Europe and the. Uh, uh, West Asia, West yeah. Asia, would that be? Yeah, and, West Asia. And, the, and the North American, South American continents. Exactly. And you can see uh, this is a different one we used before. This one has uh, North America more central on, on it. And you can see on the left side there why I would be practicing Spanish uh, with uh, Central America. Uh, coming from the northern part of the U.S. down to Central America easily there with that north-south propagation. And so uh, following this gray line is is just great. And you don't have to do all kinds of elaborate studies of this. Just pay attention to what's going on in your right. own local area with sunrise, sunset. Oh, I'm going to get into Tevia there. We won't do that. <laughs> okay, number four, what are the best 10-meter modes? Well, hey, like any other part of the hobby, any other bands, you you go with what you like to operate. Right, and if you're chasing DX, FT8 is going to be your best for cons consistent contacts and DX. Yeah, it's going to be fast and furious here with the mm -hmm. sunspots coming up. A uh, sideband is going to be most active. When, when the sunspot starts coming in here, people are going to be all over on SSB. A lot of operators, you're going to get the te technicians coming in on the lower part of the band between 28.3 and 28.5. They can use a lot of encouragement. Uh, getting into SSB, encouragement to uh, get a higher grade license and all. So this is, I hope, going to excite a lot of them. Band space uh, to practice the wide audio is there, too, on the higher end of 10. Now, I've heard some of these guys that get on with their uh, digital rigs, and they go wide on sideband. They'll go 6, 7, 8. I heard a couple of guys doing uh, 10 kilohertz wide on transmit and receive on sideband instead of, let's say, 2.7 or 3 thereabouts, and uh, incredibly good sounding audio. And some of these guys refer to it as voodoo audio. I don't know where that came from, but I've heard them use it. And I suspect we're going to get some of that, as well as AM coming in on the top end of the band. Oh, this is this is going to tickle my heart time like like the old AM days. And we were up there with our uh, lousy 6146 rigs with uh, 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 no no plate audio, man. We were just running this carrier current stuff. You'd see the S-meter bouncing on AM. Right. And because of the wide spectrum of the 10-meter band, uh, you can have a lot of fun with AM. Yeah, a lot of fun. And uh, FM is going to be fun, too. We'll see what happens with it with mm. repeaters. I don't know. Uh, it's it's just going to be interesting to see. So what are the best 10-meter antennas? Well, of course, you say with any of the the higher HF bands where it's the antennas wouldn't have to be too big, you want a multi-element, rotatable, directional. Even if it's a low mast for 10 meters, the antenna doesn't have to be quite as high for good performance. 
So you get a, uh, you know, one of these flex antennas or you get a little Yagi or something and put it up uh, and it works great. Put it up on a mast. You, uh, of course, it's more expensive. So you might be more inclined to go with a dipole, put up a horizontal dipole. Uh, you can slope it a little bit uh, vertically if you want. I talked earlier about the NFED with the HOAs and showed you a little diagram of the NFED. Uh, and we'll talk more about that. But for stealth or for temporary use, the NFEDs are great. And uh, there's always the uh, hidden attic dipoles or, and or NFED. Uh, I would suggest that if it's a newer house, you check for any kind of aluminumized insulation before you install it in the attic, though, or else you might have a, something looking like uh, Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory. Yeah. And of course, loops, you can go with those little, we're going to show you one in a few minutes, the little uh, small loops that you can get. Uh, and then of course, a big full wave loop. Let's say, what would that be about 34 feet for a full wave? Am I adding that right? 17, right. 17. Right. So if you can put a full loop outside, you're going to need a little ballon to tune that thing. A full wave loop is a fantastic antenna. I would rather have one of those than a multi-element rotatable for 10 meters just because I don't have to worry about what direction the signals are coming from. And loops tend to be very quiet on the receive end. So good point. Yeah, yeah a loop antenna is about only 35 feet in diameter. So it's something that could easily be um, hidden if you're in an HOA looped around the uh, vertically or horizontally around the deck uh, along the side of the, the house. Uh, there are very many ways to hide a loop use thin gauge wire and it's going to be virtually invisible. Yeah. And I, verticals, ground planes. Uh, I, the, a couple of months ago, I spent about three weeks steady on 10 meters every day. And a lot of the people, I would say just over half of them had verticals. And most of those verticals were actually CB antennas that they bought very inexpensively. People disenchanted with the hobby and then they just clipped them down. And of course you can get mobile antennas as well, CB mobile antennas, and you can clip those down as well if you want to do it inexpensively. So here is uh, in Tom's Florida location where <laughs> he is now, here's his rotatable dipole. Right, and this consists of uh, two ham sticks, which are each about uh, four feet long. So that gives an overall span of eight feet that you can see there in the, in the black. However, off the ends, which you can barely see in this picture, is a four foot stainless steel whip. Now this works very good in an HOA. I live in an older HOA where there aren't a lot of restrictions on antennas, uh, but it blends in very well with the old uh, VHF, UHF TV antennas. So although it's there, it's not that recognized as something out of the ordinary. Now the nice thing about a rotatable dipole is in the morning, I can orient it for propagation into Europe and Western Asia and capture some of that uh, uh, gray line activity. And then closer to noon, I can rotate it north and south orientation and get South America and into uh, northern Canada. No expense of a tower, no expense of a rotator. You just got this thing sitting on that mast. Right. I use the old Armstrong rotator yeah, method. Exactly. And so uh, a lot of my NFEDs that I didn't make myself are made by this company NFEDs, F-E-D-Z, NFEDs, antenna, bought out by Vibroplex. So I put that down there. Uh, and if you go to the Vibroplex website, I think you'll find the, a link there to the NFEDs. Now, my NFED for 10 meters, you cannot see. In fact, when I first put up an NFED here in my HOA in Michigan, I sent a note to the president of the HOA and the property manager because you have to get approval for any antennas. And I said, uh, come over, take a look at my antenna, see if we can get approval, if I should even submit it or just take it down. And they came over and looked around. They couldn't find the antenna. So the president sent me a note back and said, hey, what are you doing? Put that antenna back up so we can check it out. I said, it, it was up. He said, well, don't write me back with that problem. If we can't find it coming over there. Uh, and so it's difficult to get a photo of it. Uh, this is what it looks like from the Vibroplex site. It's got, it's that uh, ball in there is about the size of a pack of cigarettes or maybe two packs of cigarettes uh, back to back. And you can see it's a hundred watt sideband CW, 25 watts AM. It's rated at 
weight as a half pound with stainless steel hardware. So these end-fed antennas for 10 meters, uh, put them up quick. They're, they're cut to the band. If you don't want to have to make your own, you don't have to make the ballon. They're, they're really a splendid way to go. I, I encourage you to check it out. And of course, you can go with these small loops we mentioned. Here's VE9KK's Alex Loop. Alex Loop is a brand name of these mini loops that you can take out in the field and use. And here's a picture of him in his living room with it. And of course, you've got to be able to tune these things. They're going to be very sensitive to the frequency you're on. So this is not the sort of thing that you're going to uh, hang from a tree outside, whatever. You're going to have to have it close by so you can tune it. But small loops, great way to go for 10 meters. Now, what are the best 10 meter rigs? Let's have some fun here, Tom. No, of course, okay. older and newer HF transceivers, you don't need them. The newer ones that have the so-called work bands like 17 meters that I'm quite active on now. You can also go with single band transceivers. There are such things and we'll talk about them. And you can go with CB rigs. Now, we're not going to get big into having you convert CB rigs, though some people do that. It's a possibility. There are also manufacturers that make CB rigs that also make rigs for 10 and 12 meters. And here's some of the classic rigs. Uh, the TS520, that's a pre-work band rig. I have a TS5 or 820. It's a very good radio for sideband uh, and AM, there's no um, FM on it. And I wouldn't suggest it for digital use because of the fact that the VFOs aren't quite that stable, especially for FT8, where you need to be very tight on your frequency control. Uh, the other radio down there is the uh, Kenwood TS440. I'm running the uh, older brother to it, the TS430. That's all solid state. It has a very stable VFO. I use this extensively on digital modes. That's a very good radio. You can pick these up. Either one of these radios you could pick up if you watch the auction sites of the Hamfest for about $250 each. The TS520 and its uh, bigger brother, the TS820, have the advantage of having a built-in power supply. So once you buy the radio, you've got a pretty complete rig. The TS440, 430, and that ilk all require a uh, exterior power supply. So you're going to be hit up for about an extra 100 bucks or so for the power supply. But they are very good radios, um, and they'll work great on 10 meters. Yeah, the 520, you know, the old, they call them the hybrid rigs that I owned about five, five versions of them, the, the S and so on. They, uh, they will tune anything that's, that's close to 10 meters. Uh, the 520 will tune it without any external tuner, uh, and and it'll it'll work splendidly. So let's get into this business here of the CB manufacturers and sets with this President Lincoln II 10 meter amateur radio. It's actually uh, 10 and 12 meters. We posted here the Amazon description partly to show you that it's inaccurate. So you, you want to go to the manufacturer sites and look at some reviews for these kinds of rigs, but partly to also to show you price, 212 bucks here to get on 10 and 12 meters with AM, FM, upper, lower sideband, CW, 50 watts, AM, PEP, 12 watts, CW, 35 watts, sideband. Uh, this particular rig, the Lincoln 2, has uh, four or five YouTube reviews by hams that are quite positive about it. So this is a relatively inexpensive way to go. And in fact, if you just want to start taking advantage of a commute where you want to get on 10 meters during the commute with the sunspots coming in, get a mobile whip up, get one of these suckers. They're not very big. And you can see the size there and and put it in. And I, I think you'll be pres uh, pretty pleased with it. Let's see. The, uh, the presidents are they're affiliated with Uniden and. You know, people who hate and love Uniden, like all brands. And I think uh, they're made in either China or is it Thailand or Cambodia? I can't remember now, but there are two locations where they manufacture these things. Some of the design, I, th I believe, is in France, too. Um, pretty solid rigs. And, and uh, the yeah, president, I believe, is his own standalone manufacturer, Quinn, and not uh, part of Uniden. Of course, I could be mistaken. But, uh, I think that, they're affiliated with Uniden. 
I don't know if uh, I believe that some of some of the president radios are made in the same factory with Uniden, but I don't think they're the same radios with a different name on. Okay, and, and this radio has gotten great reviews. Uh, I've seen some on uh, the uh, various sites, uh, the hammer sites that have actually reviewed this radio, and uh, it gets a very solid review. If you're a, a technician or even a, a novice. I know there's a few of those around, I believe, that wants to get on 10 meters without spending a ton of money on a uh, big HF rig. This is the way to go. Yeah, I forgot to mention, in addition to technicians, we might have people who still have the novice class, even though you can't get a novice anymore, uh, that, that haven't been licensed out of that. So uh, these are going to be popular, I think, for mobile installation in particular with the sunspots coming up. Now, here, you know, we did a video, Tom, on the ugliest hf radios and, and this, is, this is the this is the pinball wizard <laughs> <laughs> of, of 10 meter of 10 meter radio whoa whoa boy oh boy oh boy i don't know what they were thinking with this kind of design but at any rate we wanted to show you this one am fm ssb um 11 meters uh i'm sorry a 10 meter not 11 meters it's not a cb rig it's 10 meters the brand is Stryker. Look at the price on this, though. $414 uh, through Amazon. And it's, it gets high reviews. Uh, 70 watts PEP. Presumably, that's one of the reasons why people might like it so much. But it's another option. I don't know that I would pay that amount of money for this thing, considering that uh, there are other options. You can go with the single band rigs that have been around for a while. One of the most popular is the 10 Tech Scout. This is one of the original ads for the 10 Tech Scout. Simple, affordable, and fun. Back then it was 500 bucks. Boy, you could almost pay 500 bucks for one of these things now if you got all of the band modules. You see in the bottom there, the band modules you can get for it. But if you can buy one of these, with a band module just for 28 megs even at a reasonable price. It's a solid rig. It could be a good way to go. And here we have your old friend there, Tom, Realistic Radio Shack. Right, the model HTX-10. And this is a very highly rated uh, radio. It's got almost, I believe, full five-star reviews on EHAM. They were very popular during Sunspot Cycle 23, which uh, 10 meters was really hopping. And then with the decline in 10 meters, ham started shedding these things like cheap suits. And you can pick these up. I've seen them on eBay for anywhere between $50 and $200, depending on the condition. Um, yeah, there's also the HTX 100. Now, don't get confused by these two rigs. The one on the bottom which is uh, a bigger and, and looks a little more maybe like a ham rig or like an HF rig at any rate. Uh, it, it doesn't have AM. It doesn't have FM. Uh, you might not be quite as pleased with it, but at any rate, I see those around too. I just saw a 100 sell on eBay for about $145. So uh, they are out there. Take a look around. Now we talked about that striker at 450 bucks or whatever they're trying to get for it. And then here is a well-known rig now, the Zygu G90. It's, I think it's in its second iteration. And this thing is all HF bands at 20 watts. And they sell for what? About 450, Tom. Right. And, and the nice thing about it is it's an SDR. So you've got some real improved uh, receiver capabilities on this as a opposed to anything else that we've seen previously. Yeah. So this is one you could actually uh, bring in the, in the house and use, uh, maybe add an amp to it if you wanted use in the car as well on, on 10 meters going to give you a little better, uh, selectivity, sensitivity, stability, Neither of us has owned one of these. We've got friends that have them and use them and uh, generally like them. There and they're, few... they're small enough you could stick it in the pocket of your cargo pants. Ah, yeah, your ham fest cargo pants where you put <laughs> all the parts you buy. Um, so what do you need to know about 10-meter operating? This is our last point. Well, it's like other HF bands. So study around a little bit. Find out what it's like operating on the other HF bands. 
listen first, especially on a band like 10 meters, because chances are you will not hear both ends of a QSO out there. So you can tune in a frequency and say, this is clear. Listen for 20 seconds. Always ask then if the frequency is in use because there might be somebody else out there. And uh, on say, sideband and AM, uh, you know, avoid using the CV jargon, breaker, contact. And especially if you get one of the, uh, like the striker rigs, uh, don't use the Roger beep <laughs> and, the echo, and the echo function. Right. It's considered bad form. Yeah, we're joking about that, but we expect to have some uh, uh, CBers and newer licensed technician people maybe who haven't operated HF sideband coming in. So keep this in mind. Listen around. Hear what hams are like. Keep your transmission short in general unless the band is really open and solid because there's going to be QSB, signals going up and down, up and down. Sometimes wildly you'll be in a QSO with somebody, S9 plus 10, bam, they're gone. What in the world happened? And then there's another station <laughs> in another location. And um, and also keep your uh, communication short in order to signal to people listening that the frequency is indeed busy. So you go back and forth. Now, if you're calling CQ on sideband or AM, give your location because that will signal to people who have the directional antennas and they're more likely right. to have them up, uh, you know, high frequencies like this than they are um, on, uh, lower down on, on 40 or 75. Uh, so I ask for calls if you're completing a QSO. I do this all the time when 10 meters is open. If it's my frequency, if I call CQ there or the other station says they're not going to stay on the frequency and it's mine, when the QSO over, is over, I say, anyone else out, out there like to talk right now? This is K8 Queen Sugar, K8 QS listening. I'd love a signal report. Anybody else out there? Now that signal report says to them, it doesn't have to be a long QSO. Right. So I'm more likely to get people responding. And conversely, it would be a good way to set up a, a round table conversation. I believe that's how we even got our net started on 10 meters. It was somebody was out there completing a QSO and three other people jumped in. So it's a good way to introduce yourself to other hams. Yeah. Uh, during the QSO, ask for stations uh, that can hear both parties. In other words, if you're working somebody on 10 and you're thinking, well, I'm just going to finish this QSO because the next person out there that comes in or maybe calls me is not going to be able to hear the other party, you never quite know. So on 17 meters lately, I've been doing this in the middle of QSOs with others. I said, hey, shall we check, see if anybody else is out there? And they say, oh, yeah, let's do it. So I say, anybody else out there that can hear both of us, please call in right now, K8QS. And sometimes people come in and they can hear both of us. So now we've got three stations going, a lot of fun. And never, ever be discouraged if the band is not open. Because by the time you go take care of your human duties and come back, it might be open. Right. And don't uh, come back another day. Don't be discouraged. Visit it regularly because you're going to have some surprise band openings. You bet. So get ready for 10 meters. Cheaply effectively. It's not going to be expensive. You are going to have a ball. This is a band of legend. As those sunspots start coming up, we're going to have a ball. I'm looking forward to it. My name is Quinn, K8QS. And I'm Tom, WA9TDD. And together we're Ham Radio Perspectives. Subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Tune in. Again, we look at the intersection of history, culture, and technology. So from the two of us to all of you, 73. Have a good day, 73s, and have fun on 10. Bye-bye.